Summer Jean is a grown-up unschooler. Today she's 34 and has never been to school, not even a single day. In this episode, we talk with her about how growing up as an unschooler has shaped her life. Join us as we uncover the impact of unschooling, the importance of trusting your child's ability to learn and how you can encourage independence and create an environment where children can thrive. And discover how unschooling can lead to a life full of critical thinking, personal growth and self-discovery, also for the parents. We hope you will enjoy this week's episode of the Self-Directed Podcast. Welcome. <laughs> My goal with inviting you, Samatine, was to to uh, show the world that uh, grown-up unschoolers are not weird. So now the burden is on oh, you. Maybe I'm not the right person <laughs> for this. <laughs> oh, you represent everybody. Yeah, everybody at one time. Everybody, just like me. All of your kids will turn out just like me. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's that's how we roll. Yeah. We have a very specific formula, step by step process, guaranteed. That's how, that's how <laughs> yes, every second year, just so, to make sure you're on track. So, exactly. so just to get get some of the facts straight, where are you and how old are you? And uh, can you tell a little about your upbringing? Sure, yeah, so I'm uh, I'm 34. So I'm one of the oldest, <laughs> one of the oldest, one of the first, the originals, um, unschoolers. And when I say unschooling, I mean like a literally like 100% from the very beginning. So I have three brothers and my mom raised all four of us outside of any kind of school system. So we didn't have any kind of required academia growing up. There was no curriculum. There was no workbooks. There was no, no like sit down study times or anything like that in my childhood for all four of us um, all the way through. And I mostly grew up um, in Northern California, in the US. And then we moved to Hawaii when I was about 10 years old. And I spent all my teen years there. And, um, and then kind of skipping ahead back and forth, mostly in Hawaii for the rest of until about a year ago, I moved to Mexico and that's where I am now. Nice. So I'm currently living in a little beautiful Mexican Puebla called Lo de Marcos. I'm just north of Puerto Vallarta and it's a gorgeous little beach town. So that's where I'm at now. <laughs> That sounds wonderful. We are actually uh, planning yeah, to. We're coming over, we are coming over uh, uh, during the, the winter to 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 go meet all these wonderful people we have met at this World School Summit we are at uh, the pop up here in Normandy. It's not nice. neither a summit nor a pop up. No, it's a co living. We're doing co living. Yeah. It's not the same. It is not the same. It's not the same. Do you know um, Lainey Liberty? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah she's here in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And I haven't seen her since 19. Yeah. I met uh, Lainey online just when she did it, pulled the plug in 08 because I had pulled another plug. And yeah, and then we finally met in 19. And then the whole big C thing came along and ruined, ruined traveling. Not for everything, years. but a lot for a while. <laughs> Yeah. So we, and for other, because a combination of the corona craziness and a medical condition within our family, we just had to stay in Europe because we couldn't risk, yeah. we couldn't fly back. So we couldn't really come over no. to anywhere, yeah. into Mexico. We, we decided Lainey, it's too risky. Actually, Lainey, I spoke at her conference last year here in Guanajuato, Mexico. Yeah, she's a great one. Yeah, she, she's really done a lot for the community. We yeah, had her. Yeah, yeah, have we, we, have, we have had. Yeah, yeah, we had her yeah, on one of our first podcast. first podcast interviews. Yeah. Um, some of for me, it's a little strange to uh, ask question. As I jokingly said in the the start, now it's on you to show the world that we are normal people, but you're just a normal person. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> No, maybe yeah. I should say the thing about the Tasmanian family. Okay. And then we warm up. So the first time we met a grown-up unschooler was when actually she just reached out in the world school community. If anyone was around, actually not even Copenhagen. We were living in Copenhagen at the time and she was in Malmo, which is in Sweden. Just across, You just have to cross a bridge. It's like 40 minutes away. And they were, <laughs> crazy story. They were bicycling Europe 
with their two children. Oh, really? oh, cool. And uh, it was raining cats and dogs and it had been for several days and the forecast was bad. And she was like, do I know anyone in this area? I need to get inside. And I said, you can jump on the train and come to my house. And she came and I didn't even know she was a grown up unschooler. unschooler. It's funny, unschooler, that's the word, yeah. Um, so she just came and she had her husband and two children and we were an unschooling family, it, but we met through world schooling, which is not the same. You can sit down with workbooks traveling the world. Well, yeah, I mean, world schooling just means that you're, um, you're doing some form of home education while traveling. Yeah, basically traveling while you have children that would normally go to of, As far as I understand it, you could be following some kind of curriculum or doing yeah. some kind of homeschooling, yeah. a version of homeschooling, relaxed homeschooling, eclectic home, whatever. It could be any of those things, or it could be unschooling, or it could be radical unschooling, or it could be, you know, some offshoot. Um, but I think mostly it's just that you're not in school and you're live, you're traveling. <laughs> that seems to be... Even and some general. world schoolers are in school and they just yes. take big chunks of That's time true. out to travel. So yeah, there's yeah. no really not any rules. I would say the yeah. rules for unschooling are more strict. Uh, I wouldn't be so sure, but I really, I prefer to have well-defined. I like things to be well-defined. I like definition, especially when it comes to language, because otherwise, how do you communicate and have conversations okay. about things? And so I've actually been, uh, one of my unpopular opinions that uh, a lot of people in the unschooling and homeschooling communities, I, I, I ruffle some feathers because they really don't like it when I define unschooling in a very practical sense. Um, they kind of want it to be this very ambiguous kind of thing that they can sort of apply to whatever they want and be like, oh, well, we're almost unschoolers. And I'm like, that's not yeah, a we thing. We unschool in the weekend. Yeah, people, we unschool, we unschool, well, we, we, we unschool part of the time, we unschool mm. sometimes, we unschool everything but math, or we unschool, and I said, no, I'm like, no, I'm sorry, no, um, that's some form of homeschooling, you're doing some form of schooling at home, that is called homeschooling, mm. unschooling means you do not require your children to do academic schoolwork or anything that resembles schoolwork at all. Um, it doesn't mean that, and then that's the thing is it's like people want to think it means, oh, you never make them brush their teeth and you never, no, we're talking about the, just the very basic minimum definition and the practical reality is there's no required schoolwork. That's it. That's it. On top of that, everything else is parenting and philosophy and all these other things. But if you want to just get really, really practical, school is when you go to an institution to learn. Homeschool is when you do that learning at home. Unschooling is when you do not require that learning at all and you let that learning happen through life. Mm -hmm. So that's like, I like to define those three categories very clearly because otherwise, what are we talking about? People go, oh yeah, well, you know, and they say they're unschoolers and I start getting into a conversation with them only to find out that they're following a curriculum for math and English. And I say, well, then you're not unschooling. And they go, oh yeah, well, but we're, mo we're mostly unschooling. I guess that's not a thing. No, no. me neither. But I've, I've lost a few friends actually with the exact same opinion. And yeah. I remember entering the community in the beginning, I found it hard because it seemed like, I don't know, elite-ish that if you couldn't let go, de-schooling takes time. I, I sure. was in school for 23 years straight and I come from a family of academics. It was yeah. really hard. I got the point, but it was really hard to actually do oh, it. I can, and this kick imagine. out like you're not the real one. It was. Yeah, no, I can see that can be really hard. And I think a lot of people take it that way in a, in a judgment sense. And I don't ever mean it in a judgment sense. I just like to have definitions. Yeah, no, but me neither nowadays. You and know, also, like this, I think this is a cup, right? This is a cup. It's always a cup. It's, it's not a jar. Sometimes. It looks a little bit like a jar, but it's not. Yeah. It's a cup. But yeah. it's not. It's technically, yeah. it's technically, we can define this and say yeah. what it is yeah. and what its purpose is and what makes it what it is. Mm. Um, and so I understand why people don't like to define terms. You know, they don't like to define them because then you have to stick to them and then you can't like have your cake and eat it too. Some people want to be like, oh, we're unschooling, but they're not quite there yet in their comfortability. So they're still doing some schoolwork. And like, I don't want to criticize that at all. I mean, I'm not criticizing anyone who's not fully unschooling. If you're not fully unschooling, you're wrong. Like that is not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying, let's define it. Let's say, oh, cool. 
you're doing relaxed homeschooling. That's amazing. That's amazing. Good for you. I am so stoked on that. Just call it what it is. Mm. That's all. Just so that we can have these more significant conversations and know what we're all talking about. And because if you're not going to define unschooling as no school, then what is that? Exactly. What, what is what is that then? What is how I was raised then? I don't. And the thing is too is like my oldest brother. How old is he now? He's forty. He's over forty. And um, you know we were some of the the early ones to even use that term, and we wore that term very proudly. And that was like we were unschoolers, and we all knew what that meant. That had a very clearly defined definition. It meant you didn't do schoolwork. That's what it meant. You know, and then of course, yeah, you can get into the deeper philosophies about why and how that works and how you support that process and all of these things. But we could all, like, we all held that title. And if you take that away, and if you say all these different things are unschooling, then what what are we anymore? You're just like kind of, to me, it was a little bit like, hey, <laughs> wait a second. It's like my childhood. Don't get that. But that's not what it means. And now I'm I'm understanding why people, why because there is a little bit of a clickish thing happening in different communities in the homeschooling community. You know, like there's these clickish things happening where people get a little weird about the titles and the labels. And to me, it's just like a practical thing. It's not to shame anyone or to judge anyone. It's just a practical thing. It's like, oh, cool, you're doing this, awesome. I'm doing this. Like, but. But it is, I can see why, like some people are using, well, they're saying we're almost unschoolers because they don't feel like they fit in to the unschooling community and they don't feel like they quite fit into the radical unschoolers or they don't, you know, and so they're, they're, they're kind of trying to define what they are and they don't feel like they fit into any of the established definitions. So I get that. I'm not like calling anybody out for being wrong. I'm just saying for the purposes of my conversations, I like to define them so that people know what I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah I get you. I think especially the problem arises or it, it like mm, has ripple effect if we talk about unschooling and it could be unschooling with mandatory math, let's say. And that's and not people who do unschooling with mandatory math start teaching other people how to unschool yes. answering questions that's when i get i have yeah. i want to say hey wait a minute because yes. unschooling you wouldn't know because you're unschooled but f coming from a schooled perspective being the parent getting the idea but having to actually do it let go yes such a dark place it puts you in so much fear and so much discomfort and you have to even you you fight with yourself on the inside which yeah. is a lot of work the whole de-schooling process and you know oh, yeah. you just have to trust it and then well, you have to explain to your mother-in-law and you have to explain to the bus driver and you know you have to fight people off yeah you're going and then to someone that. comes and tell me oh but i'm unschooling with a math book <laughs> then, yeah I, yes I know. I understand. Yeah. I know. I can't have it. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly. I feel the same way, even though I wasn't the mother, so I can only imagine. <laughs> but I feel the same way in the sense that it's like it de devalues what you've gone through. Yeah, and it, to uh, teach people that that's okay. That's what unschooling is. It it's, is okay, but it's not unschooling. And we just right, have exactly. to be clear on what we're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I... Um, I've, you know, I've, I've found like, well, maybe because I, I have a lot of these conversations and I have a lot of interaction with people around this topic and I'm finding that like, maybe I need to like, part of me is like rebellious and I want to hang on to that term and I'm proud of that term and I claim that term. And another part of me is like, you know what, maybe I should just let that go and let people, whatever, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. um, and make up a new term, like, like, like something that, that better describes or defines also unschooling. It's like, it's un something and it's not, yeah, it's yeah. not un something. Well, it's, it actually it's... like has nothing to do with schooling at all. And it's more about living as if school never existed in the yeah, first place. Yeah. I've never even heard of any of that bullshit. So oh. it's like, it's just you you know, um, and I'm, yeah, it's I'm, really weird to define what we're doing by what we're not doing. Exactly. That's what yeah. I, yeah. It's not <laughs> like we get up every morning and say, oh, today we will not go to school. 
right. uh, life is not like yeah. that. I like the self-directed learning, uh, but I think that unschooling this has been a technical. unschooling has been a term for so long that many people gets it and gets easily that it's something without school. Yes. Um, I don't know. I presume you have, may have had this talk with your mom, but uh, what led her all those years ago down the road of uh, choosing unschooling or wanting not to school her children? Yeah, we get that question a lot. Um, it's not. It's not any one thing. That's the. No. That's the thing. And it wasn't like some big revelation that happened all at once. You know, my mom was very, very young. She was twenty-one when she had my oldest brother, Garrett. She was a very sweet, extraordinarily shy introvert um, of a girl. And she did not know she was going to do anything differently than anyone else. She's just normal. She thought she was. <laughs> and she, um, yeah, she just, she had this baby boy and it was like one thing led to another. And it was tiny little seeds of questions that started popping up for her. Um, and it wasn't even about school initially. It's kind of like when you start to question one thing, you know, it's like you pull the thread and unravel the whole sweater. Yeah. And um, so she started to question one thing and it led to another thing and it opened up different doors and, and in herself and um, being in alignment with her own sense of rightness and what felt in alignment with her instincts, her mothering instincts. And somehow my mom had extremely strong <laughs> mothering instincts and then somehow had the ability to hear them and then the courage to actually listen to them and follow through and um so it was little by little you know it was like um it was first it was things like wait why would I circumcise my baby you know it was like little questions like wait why would I do this just because everyone else is doing it or like and then she'd start to look into it and she'd find information and then she'd be like actually this is not the right choice for my family we don't need to do this um, and she did that with other things, other medical choices. Um, and then it, I'm the third born. And so by the time I came along, she even had a home birth and she just wanted less and less intervention. And, and she started to realize like, she was so in love with her children. She was so enraptured like with her children. And then when it came to like giving her kids away to strangers to be trained um, by this society that she didn't even really agree with it was kind of like wait why would I leave my child with these random people all day that I won't even know what's going on or what kind of input he's having and also she said she's like part of it was selfish she's like I wanted to hang out with him like why should someone else get to hang out with my kid like I want to hang yeah. out with my kid Absolutely. Um, so it was little things like that and it was also just like the little training things you know like my um you're supposed to put your baby in a crib to cry themselves to sleep. I mean, we're talking 40 years ago, you know, my grandparents were very traditional in a lot of ways. And um, they were horrified at my mother. And it was like, put him in a crib to cry himself to sleep. And, and like, no, she was just like, no, like, no, that's wrong. Like she tried it once. And she was like, there's no way that that's healthy for anybody. Um, and so it was all very heart centered for her. It was very intuitive. It was very, um, it wasn't like this mental process actually. And then you know what happens like when you start to you open yourself up to seeing different things and then information will come to kind of fill that curiosity. And um, books started showing up like somehow she got a hold of the book Summer Hill by A.S. Neal. Um, and that was like, you know, and and then all my cousins went to Waldorf school. They actually started a Waldorf school in our town and um, my mom tried to start a little school at her house and that didn't really work out. And then the Waldorf school happened and everyone else went to Waldorf and she was the only one. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, it's kind of like a, it's just, it was like a little by little process of her just questioning, like, wait, why would I do this? Wait, what's the point of this? And is that true? You have to put your kids in school. Is that true though? Why? Why? Why are we doing that? It doesn't seem to be working out so well. If you look around like <laughs> society these days, um, people are not very happy or healthy. So I think maybe we should do something different. That was kind of very simple. It's very simple childlike curiosity in a way. And just little by little starting to question and then finding out about the history of the public school system in the US and the history of um, schooling in general. 
and its origin its original intention its creators and its original intention and a lot of people don't realize that the original intention had absolutely nothing to do with education whatsoever it had nothing to do with supporting human life on this planet at all it had to do with controlling a population and creating um adequate unquestioning worker a workforce um, and that's very clearly documented and stated um, when the school system was implemented that that was the intention um, and I, it's still I still really very much would love your mom also <laughs> <laughs> now we're actually not talking. No, 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 no. But but it's just fun to hear, and yeah. and I he has been strong uh, in that time. Uh, well, my mom, she yeah, actually, and my mom is not a talker. That's the thing. I'm the one that talks. Um, yeah, she talks to me, <laughs> but yeah. she's she's a she's an introvert, and um, it's interesting because of what she went through and what she did. A lot of what she did seems contrary to the personality when you meet her because um, what she had to go through, like what you were saying earlier, like the fighting the world and the constantly defending yourself, even when it, it, like you do feel constantly attacked when you're choosing to do something um, different than the mainstream narrative in any way, you feel like you're under constant attack and you have to be constantly defending yourself. And so my mom, she was incredible, like, and she had to fight through so much. I mean, you wouldn't believe my dad's family. Uh, we were taken to court, you know, we had CPS show up at our house. We had, you know, it was bad. Like my grandparents tried to have us taken away because we weren't in public school. Oh, that's and, um, and the list goes on and on and on. And what my mom had to go through to stay true to herself and her convictions and protect her children um, is incredible. It's incredible. And I'll be forever, forever grateful. Yeah. One thing you said about the, the mothering instinct um, uh, and how she understood to listen to herself uh, in our family, it also came from the mother, from Cecilia. And uh, even though I were um, more uh, wild and rebellious than a lot of the normal normal dads out there, I still uh, succeeded in uh, holding, holding, hold, really holding my wife back. I was like, I, I needed the control. I was like, oh, you need to teach them. You, uh, I want you yeah. to do this and this start. And, and it, I can see now that it came from uh, fear of what other people would think. It came from fear about taking the responsibility. But as the dad that was out of the house and working, um there's also the not knowing and then it's easier if i was thinking oh she's sitting down every day with yeah. them and doing this and this and that yeah. uh, and and cecilia tried to please me in a short uh, period and then she didn't and then she does did, did what she wanted and i, I said i would yeah. and when i said it i meant it, it yeah I, because i respect that my children have two parents yeah. sure um, but then you couldn't follow through and enforce but it. Then actually you know, sitting there was like just such heart. a nightmare. Yeah. It was such yeah. a nightmare. And it only made things worse if you yeah. what had an intention of, you know, having children that would eventually learn to read. Sitting down, pushing them was the wrong thing to oh, do. Yes. And uh, well, I hated it basically. And I had a baby at the time, like yeah. on my hip. And yeah. It was just not the right. So I said I would do it, and every day I failed. Yeah. And every day I had the best intention to do it again tomorrow, and I failed again. And yeah. in the yeah. end, well, the thing is, is like it's um like what what you were saying, like being the father and you not being there all day yeah. long and seeing what was going on. That's a that's a difficult position when you it don't is. have control and you also don't have the immediate experience of the moments throughout the day, and you don't. I think a lot of fathers go through that who aren't in the home. Like if there's a stay-at-home mom and there's a father that's out of the home and when they start moving toward some kind of um, homeschooling or unschooling, um, that the father doesn't get to see a lot of the learning that happens outside of the schooling process. So the life, the life learning kind of stuff. And a lot of people, you know, like you were saying, it's really, really hard to let go of that control because there's so much fear like the fear is so intense. And the thing is that people don't realize that the, that fear, it's not yours. 
that fear was instilled in you from the time you were forced to sit there and focus your mind and energy and attention on something that you weren't ready for or comfortable with or anything like that, because you believe, you believe your parents and not just your parents, you believe society. How can you not? You believe the world that you're born into. These are the people that love and protect you and care for you. So you are going to believe them when they tell you and not in words necessarily, but through their actions that you cannot be trusted with yourself, that your choices and your decisions are wrong. And you have to listen to an outside authority in order to be okay in this life, that you will be a failure and you will be a screw up if you don't do what other people think you should do and do things that are against your nature, things that make you uncomfortable, things that you're not ready for things that are wrong for you. If you don't do what other people tell you to do, you will not be okay. And that's the message that kids get every single day in a million different ways. And it's not just through required academia. It's through all kinds of messages that we're unconsciously sending children all the time. And so as an adult, when you've been through that programming your whole life, it's like you're in a cult. And you're, you have to get out, you're trying to get out of this cult, but the programs uh, are still running, you know, the program really is still big running. cult. Yeah. It's yeah. really yeah. hard to get out, it's everywhere. Yeah. And one thing that's uh, it's really difficult also is, uh, should I look back at my 10 years in the public school system and look at them as waste? Oh, but that exactly is in, no, yeah, yeah, but that I can understand how it imprints in people the the feeling of it, it was right for me, so it must be right for others because otherwise yeah, well, you could admit that you have wasted your time. I yeah. was I was lucky in the way that I were interested in so many other things that yeah. I after high school had just had fun and lived my life and worked with yeah. only what I wanted to do. Um, but so did I. After yeah. high school, I think it was before high school was a was really a nightmare yeah. and a waste of time. Yeah, after high school was fun for me. That was university. I did ten years and I enjoyed every day of it. Didn't yeah. specifically enjoy the testing, but I did enjoy university. It was fun in for me. Yeah, and well, I, no, I know life is a waste. You know, you still live. Yeah. You still lived those moments and you lived those years, and and none of that is a waste. Um, oh, I would say the time. waste was on the effort of the adults around you. That's where the waste was. They were wasting their time and energy and effort um, to have an effect on you, to control you and to direct your course. That was their waste, not yours. But I think I wasted a lot of time in school. I would really yeah. have enjoyed. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you can say like you your whatever, effort whatever was a waste. Not. I didn't like it there. Yeah, I didn't like any, not even one single day of school. So for me, it was a waste of time. And as soon as I could eat, I did. So, so Summer, how was a normal day as an unschooled child? I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. So do you still get the question if you can read, whether you can read? Yeah, like, well, I mean... It, it, Mostly, My kids um, get them all the time. Can you read and do you have any friends? That's like the two top questions. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's always the one, right? How did you learn how to read? Like it's people are paranoid about it as if reading is like rocket science or something. It's hilarious. It's, hard. Yeah. Um, it's, it's hilarious to me, honestly. And the socialization question, that one is like oh, yes. super common. Yeah. And when we were kids, my older brother, he's a, a little bit of a comedian and he would get a kick out of answering questions in ways that would like confuse people or, or question, you know, like um, question their position kind of thing. So like adults, well, what about socialization? And he would go, well, I'm talking to you right now, aren't I? <laughs> that was a really good one. We like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we all learned. It's interesting because there's four of us, so we can really see like that's a pretty good you know test <laughs> like you can not test but you can see with four individuals growing up in the same household um without schooling and that we all learned very different things at very different ages and for very different reasons also mm -hmm. which is the thing that i really like to point out is that we didn't learn to read for the sake of reading actually so um or at least not all of us some of us did, 
and my older brother Clay was like four and he was just like, I want to know how to read like today's the day. And that was it. Like he sat my mom down with this one book and he didn't want to move until he could read that whole book. And he wasn't even five years old. Um, he was like four and a half or something like that. And so that's what he did. And that's very um, much like his personality. <laughs> and then um, Garrett, my oldest, oldest brother, actually, he, which is, this could go into a whole nother subject. He was a lot older. He was like 12. And a huge reason for the delay for him, um, because I would call it a delay for him. Not every child is delayed if they're not reading till 12. But he would have been reading a lot long, younger. And this was obvious to my mom. If there hadn't been pressure from yeah. my dad and my dad's parents and the rest of the family, if there had yeah, not been exactly fear, that. if there had not been this constant panic and pressure around him to learn, um, he probably would have been fine. He would have learned a lot younger, but because of that, he, it made him self-conscious. Like he had a spotlight on him and he was afraid of disappointing people and people made him afraid that he couldn't do it because the grandparents would ask questions like that. Um, they were horrible, they were awful in, in the way that they pressured us and made us feel in the way that they worded their comments. They made us feel as children that we were somehow inadequate or we weren't gonna be okay in the world if we didn't do these things now. And they made us question ourselves. And if that hadn't been there, um, I know there's things that I would have learned younger and that my other brothers would have learned younger. And luckily, by the time it got to me, my mom, there was a lot less involvement with these people, um, with that part of my family. And um, I had a lot less of that pressure. So I'm actually very aware of it because I can see it. And I have these memories, whereas my older, oldest brother was very much more immersed in that. And he had it constantly. He was also the first grandchild on both sides of the family. So there was like really intense yeah. attention on him. Um, and my mom could only, you know, she tried her best to protect him from that, but it still, it still got to him. And so he didn't really start reading fluently until he was about 12 um, because he was terrified of the watchful eyes all the time. That's what really set him back. But then he's amazing. Like he's, uh, he's amazing. <laughs> um, the stuff that he does now today, like um, everyone thought, like a lot of, a lot of my grandparents and that they thought that none of us would be okay. Like they were really terrified, you know, they were really terrified and I feel for them. Like I have so much compassion, like what they had to go through watching their grandkids and like, um, think like having no understanding. Yeah, and, but, but, and Sama, how do you define okay? That's fun, right? Uh, how people um, okay, define what okay is. You're okay. You're okay. Yeah. <laughs> But as in their mind, so okay would have been you you need to have a certain kind of job, you need to well, you know, to them, I think they're they're quite simple people. Um they're they were, you know, cattle ranchers and cowboys, and um to them they just wanted to make sure that we were like, you know, actually average would have been just fine to them. Just have a steady job and support yourself was really kind of the main thing. And they were just afraid that we weren't actually gonna be able to get jobs, like even even, you know, low level job, like any jobs, they were just afraid we weren't going to be able to get jobs because we weren't going to be able to count change, basically, you know, like that was their level of fear um, that we weren't going to be able to interact with people work in customer service because we were so socially awkward, or we weren't going to be able to have basic math to count change, or we weren't going to be able to, you know, read and write so that we couldn't even, you know, write notes or, or, or take orders or, you know, that's, that was their level of fear. So they're, they're, um, when they said, okay, they just wanted us to be able to function and support ourselves. Like, I think that was, that was it. They didn't need doctors. I think that's a common fear though. That, yeah. that I think it's that's what common. people yeah. think when they ask, do they have any friends? Can they read? Will they ever socialize? They yeah. think that all these things can only be learned in school. Yes. High yeah. School. Because we've yeah. lost, because we've lost, um, any faith in human nature mm. in our, in our basic what what we are like people are like i said this i think in um i think it was at that conference um that people are not afraid for their children they're actually afraid of their children you are afraid of what your children are essentially that's the fear is that you are somehow inherently wrong actually that's the real fear is that it's about you um 
is that you are somehow inherently wrong and inadequate and stupid at your core because that's the only way that you could think that forcing another human being um, is somehow justifiable is because you think that if you don't do that, if you if nature had took its course, it would be wrong. It would be awful. So you literally like we have this as a society, we seem to have this very, very low opinion of ourselves and our children of human nature that we don't we don't trust. Um, we just don't trust. We think that that somehow what like what are you going to be if you don't get forced like you're going to just be a drooling idiot in the corner. Like that seems to be what people think is going to happen if you don't force it. Um, yeah. Which is funny because everything else, if you look around, everything else on this planet naturally seems to unfold according to its nature. Um, and it doesn't need to be forced by an outside authority. Um, so yeah. It, yeah, it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird deal. I feel like it really comes from, that belief that was instilled in you and it just keeps getting passed down generation to generation of it being like if you don't do if i don't control you you're going to be a failure and then the kid grows up being like i'm bad i'm wrong and i need to listen to a higher authority in order to be okay and then they continue to pass that down i'm bad i'm wrong yeah. and um that what other conclusion can you come to as a child what other conclusion can you come to because when someone, as a child, when someone sits you down and they say, you have to do this thing, and it feels all kinds of wrong in your body, it goes against your sense of rightness. All you want to do is have your bare feet on the grass and you want to pick flowers and sing songs and build fairy houses in the woods. That was me. Um, or like my brother, for instance, he'd rather be working on a wooden boat model in the garage or Clay would rather be reading books and crocheting hats. Like that was his that is what felt right for us in that moment. And as soon as someone tells you, you cannot follow your own instincts, your sense of rightness, your passions, your interests, you can't follow them. They're wrong. You have to do what I tell you to do, or you're going to screw up in life. And so as a child, when you get that message, like, what are you going to do with that? It's just, I'm wrong. I can't be trusted. I can't make my own choices or decisions. Like, what do you rely on then in life? You know, what do you use as a sense of discernment, if not your own sense of rightness? And so it's like we're undermining humans own sense of rightness. And then we no longer know anymore what our nature is, what we're really made of, what's really true to us. Nobody knows anymore. They don't know what's true to them because they had that crushed inside them when they were little and they believed it because it got repeated to them over and over and over. I mean, it's literal brainwashing. It is. So I had the exact opposite, um, at least from my mom. Like I still got some of that brainwashing because I grew up on this planet in this society, you know, um, in this in this family that had all of this fear. I only had the one woman. And luckily she happened to be my mother. And um, she was my ultimate authority, you know, the mother and the father. And but my parents split when I was really young and my dad wasn't um, super involved in this in the schooling or education he was a weekend dad and he was great he just he didn't really understand either and he was afraid also but um but he was a good dad and anyway where was I going with that oh just that I had the opposite my mom I had the primary parent in my life always telling me that I knew you know I knew what was right for myself in my life that I I did know and that I could and and I remember her telling me too like you can't get it wrong. You know, whatever you choose is going to be right for you. Um, and to have that sense of like security and empowerment in yourself as a child and to be told constantly that like my choices are my own. It also meant that those consequences were my own. It also meant that I couldn't blame anyone else for my failings in life. Mm -hmm. It also means that I don't get to point the finger and say, you didn't educate me properly. You know, you didn't tell me to do this and you didn't tell me to do that because I grew up knowing that that was my choice that it wasn't anyone else's job to tell me what to do, that it was my job to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing here. Um, and that I need to follow my own sense of rightness and to make those choices for myself. And in my family, you know, um, respect and freedom, like finding those lines and those boundaries was something that we did together. You know, my mom didn't come in with this big grand plan, you know, this was little by little, and this was something she did with her children. 
This is something we developed together as a community, as a tribe. Um, it was always, what are we going to do about this, you guys? Hey, this isn't working. What are we going to do? It was always this, like, this we. And there was very few times in my childhood um, that my mom would, like, pull the, pull the mom card, you know? And, and that usually was when it came to protection, um, things that she felt were, were, like, harmful or toxic or dangerous to her children. She very much felt that, that was her position to be defending and protecting because she is the filter between us and the world. And... Um, and it was up to her to kind of tell our level of developmental appropriateness for certain um, influences and input, you know, and, and that's, that comes from the time that they're babies, you know, like you don't just let them eat whatever when they're infants, oh, no. even if they grab it, you, you stop them from putting certain things in their mouth because that's your job. And, and that doesn't change no matter how old, you know, as they get older, that doesn't change. What you let them put in their mouth does change. But the fact that that's your job um, to make sure they don't stick their finger in a socket, that doesn't change. Mm. So um, that was kind of, that's an evolution that we all, like that my mom, it was over time, you know, that those things evolve and it's unique to each child and it's unique to each family. So for instance, in my family, like we, we didn't have certain things um, like especially when it came to food things. My mom was extremely health conscious and she was very aware that everything you eat affects your brain development and your emotional state. Um, and so for her, her job was to keep us in our natural state of balance. Um, and that meant providing a, a space and an environment. It didn't mean controlling us. It meant holding a space for us to thrive. And it meant um, keeping certain things at bay that could possibly throw us off of our natural um, course, our natural developmental state. So when I try to describe this to people, because a lot of people like there's the radical unschooling, which basically is just like complete, oh, yeah. complete, no, no um, structure, no boundaries, no routine, no rhythm, no, nothing like that. Um, and I like to make sure that people know that that's not, I wasn't, that's not how I was raised. Um, and I was raised with that freedom and respect are mutual things. And we all have to find where our freedoms meet and curb each other. And that no one's freedom is more important than another's freedom. Um, and, and finding those places and those boundaries together as a family, you know, and finding where those lines are and what respect means. And I respect you and you respect me, but what does that really look like? And, um, Yes, you have the freedom to want to do this, but I have the freedom to not participate. Um, you know, like where are those places? Just because you want something, you have the freedom to want that doesn't mean I have to get it for you. Um, I have the freedom to say no also. So it's like finding finding all those places. And um, and I feel like a lot of people in when they start learning about unschooling, it looks really scary because there's a lot of the radical unschooling or not even the radical, but all this, there's so much, right? Because there's a, a million different subcategories because although you can define unschooling as saying no academic schoolwork, that says nothing about why, the philosophy from where you're coming from, you know, and what you really believe about your children and what your parenting philosophy, that could be different. People unschool for lots of different reasons. People homeschool for lots of different reasons. And I think that the reasons you choose to homeschool or unschool are going to drive everything. That's what's going to really like create the whole tone or style or flavor of your life with your children is, is what's driving you, what's that reason. And for my mom, um, it was, um, she just felt that, how should I say this? She wanted her children to, she just felt that we had the freedom to think for ourselves. And she wanted, she wanted to respect our right to think for ourselves, to have our own thoughts and develop, develop our own mechanisms. And um, so it's, it's like a non-invasive, I would say that my mom was kind of like a non-invasive parent. So it was like, she was tending the garden, but how do you, it's kind of like that metaphor, you know, how do you, um, you don't fix the flower. If the flower is wilting, you don't fix the flower. You, you change the environment, you mm -hmm. alter the environment to better support that flower thriving. So that was kind of my mom's parenting. It was like, um, 
She was non-invasive in the sense that she didn't try to fix and change us and make us be a certain way. She tried to create an environment where we could thrive. And um, yeah, so that's that's kind of, that's my, my rant, my rant about that. <laughs> uh, that I've done a beautiful I, rant. I, I, did learn, I, did learn, uh, I did learn how to read, finally. Um, yeah. uh, but not until I was, well, my thing with learning how to read too is that my learning happened very slowly over a very long period of time. Um, I would pick it up and then I'd get frustrated and I'd put it down. And that happened over years, little by little by little. And I'd be like, mom, I want to read, help me learn how to read. She'd be like, okay, how do you want to do this? Um, which is the other beautiful thing about my mom was that she never came at me with like a set plan of like, this is how you learn how to do this thing. It was always like, okay, how do you want to learn? You know, mm -hmm. I want to learn how to read. Okay. Where do you want to start? What do you, why, why do you want to learn how to read? Is it this book or that sign or just in general, because knowing your motivation is going to help um, mm -hmm. with the how to, you know? And then it's like, okay, well, we can learn the sounds of the letters. You want to do it that way? Or do you want to, you know, it was like, how does your brain work? How are you going to be able to absorb this information? So it was always a together we process. And my mom never pretended like she had some grand plan and knew what she was doing. It was always like, let's figure it out together. Um, which is a beautiful thing as a child because it gets your own wheels turning. It means you have some responsibility in the process and you're involved and um, you have a say. And I think it promotes um, critical thinking actually to be included in all of that kind of process. So yeah, for me, it was like little by little um, through random exposure, you know, on accident. Um, and then the few times, the few times, like over the years where I'd be like, I want to learn how to read and I'd sit there and I'd try and mom would try to help me. And then I'd get really frustrated and I'd give up and she'd be like, ah, no problem. Um, she never cared if I gave up because that was my choice. And, um, she also knew that she knew that I would read, like she wasn't afraid. She did. She knew that all of her kids would read. She loved reading. There was books everywhere. She read to us every night. Um, she was a big reader and to her that was a wonderful magical thing why would someone not want to know how to read of course they're going to want to know how to read you know she kind of just like expected her kids to love reading just like she did so she never worried about it and um so she didn't care if we gave up and she didn't care how old we were it was um not that she didn't care but she wasn't concerned and she knew that we would when we were ready and or when it was necessary in our lives and she knew it would become necessary and so for me it was um I think I read Jonathan Livingston Siegel first, but I really struggled through it when I was about 10. And um, because I knew how to read like intellectually, like I knew how, but I struggled, like it didn't click, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I was frustrated with it. I was one of those kids that if I couldn't get something right the first time, I would just, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. unless I really loved it. And so finally what happened was Harry Potter and a friend of mine was really into Harry Potter and she, we became pen pals. It was right around the same time. So there was a reading writing thing that happened to me right at the same time. Yeah. She wanted to be pen pals and she wanted to discuss Harry Potter, which meant I had to read Harry Potter. So mom started reading Harry Potter out loud to my brother and I, and then um, we both got impatient because we didn't want to wait till that evening for her to read the next chapter. We got so into the story. So then my little brother who was nine, he started reading ahead. And I was like, uh-uh. That's -uh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> gonna happen. It's not going to happen. And so I, one afternoon, I picked that book up. I sat on the couch and I declared to my family that I would not get up until I could read fluently, like with ease. Um, and that's exactly what I did. And I called my mom over a few times to help me out. And within about an hour or two, because I was already right there, you know, after so many years of, of attempting little bits here and there and learning bits here and there. And, uh, so it only took like an hour or two and then it clicked and then I was reading like lightning and then I devoured pretty much every book within my grasp for the next couple of years. I was like a six, eight hours a day in fantasy novels. I mean, yeah. I read not even fantasy novels. Like I read classic literature. I was obsessed with Shakespeare. I read almost every Shakespeare play um, by choice, you know? Um, so it, it's kind of amazing. It's like when I feel like sometimes people don't understand that learning oftentimes is like eating like you have to wait till you're really hungry to appreciate it <laughs> yeah 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 I also think that the whole thing with voluntary 
learning versus forced is just we had a child who learned all the math you would normally learn in a school situation within three months because she felt like it yeah and we had a child who picked up a book and started reading when she was four because she thought it'd be kind of cool and yeah and you know and yes they've read Shakespeare and yes they know everything about ancient cultures and weird stuff because they feel like it and it's not yes. when when you learn it's something because you want to learn it what and it's probably also because you didn't separate it from the rest of life like you didn't go here's academic learning and it's over here in this special category and it's really difficult and you need a teacher and you need to learn it in this certain way you didn't do that and I have to force you. You didn't make you didn't make learning separate from life. You didn't. No. See it kind of like it reminds me often of. But like did you read Shakespeare to learn? No, no. That's the thing. We didn't do these things, or and my kids certainly didn't do these things to know world history or to be really smart on symbols or to be able to quote Shakespeare. It's because it tastes it's, good. It's, well, because, it's because you feel it's like enjoying. doing yeah. it. Yeah, Shakespeare is awesome. Because it's yeah. fun to read it. You don't read it so that you can say, oh, I've read Shakespeare. It, it, and I think a lot, of people, a lot of people don't even realize that's possible because they were force fed oh, so much. young. Yeah. Yeah. And, they, and they, um, that their idea of like what they want to do with their free time and enjoyment is just nothing. Like they want to sit there and watch TV. So they assume that's what their children would do because, mm -hmm. um, because to them, it's like, but when you don't have, like, when you don't have that, that input, the things that are not right for you constantly being shoved down your face, when you don't have this constant, you're not being required to use your energy and attention in ways which are wrong for you at that time or that stage of development. Um, and when you're allowed to get really bored and to have to just be with yourself and that's it, you know, like you you do you enjoy like these things are wonderful Shakespeare is wonderful I mean I used to read it and just get all these feels and run into the kitchen and be like mom and I'd read her some passage because I was just overwhelmed with emotion and beauty and um and I think a lot of people they don't ever get to have that experience because if you're hateful like if you're resentful and you're like you have to read this now and you it's like every anything you'd rather be doing anything else and all you want to do is look out the window and they're telling you you have to look here and you have to take in this thing you're going to miss all the magic of it yeah. you know it's going to have no value no personal value no emotional value it's just going to be this thing you were forced to do and you, you know? forget all about it yeah one thing i find kind of fun with our society is that uh, at some point um, well we interviewed a guy called Chris Edward recently where he talked about um, that 85 percent of the global workforce don't work with something they're passionate about mm -hmm. um, and at the same time uh, we have a culture of uh, praising people who are living their passionate life uh, are you a musician? Are you an entrepreneur? People who are driven, we 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 put them on um, on this pedestal, but at the same time, we are holding people back uh, from yeah. from learning how to be motivated, uh, yeah. learning how to follow your motivation, yeah. and and it's just sometimes I'm like that is kind of stupid. Well, it's extremely hypocritical. The whole thing is extremely hypocritical to um, to take a child. And to very purposefully train them for 12 years that um, to not make their own choices, to not make their own decisions, to obey, to follow orders. Um, and then suddenly at 18, we're like, okay, what are you going to do with your life? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? I've never been allowed to do anything I wanted to do. Like, I don't even know anymore, you know? And it's, it's really kind of incredible the expectations that society has. <laughs> like, what? It's ex the, the hypocrisy is astounding because. Um, to expect someone to do something you've been telling them not to do yeah. for 12 years. Like you've literally been training them not to for 12 years. And then you're like, okay, now you can do it. You're like, but it's been 12 years, man. I don't even remember. Yeah. I don't even know what I like. I don't even know, you know? Um, whereas like, and then you have a lot of people that are just okay at a lot of things and uh, expertise is dying. And um, especially when it comes to, you know, um, like trades and crafts and things like that, the experts are dying. 
And, um, and it's like, you can see why, why the school system was created. Cause you want people to work in factories. You want them working for Amazon. You don't want them making their own candles and selling at the farmer's market, you know, not in our society. That's not what, like, mm-hmm. that's not what is in the, the hot, whatever you could say, highest interest of like, um, the intentions of the corporations and the, who's in control and everything. It doesn't benefit them to have passionate individuals starting their own businesses and being creative and being artistic and, and being experts at things, even if it's not necessarily artistic. You know, my older brother, Clay, he's a um, brilliant computer. You know, he works for some fancy startup company. I don't even know. I can't even describe, explain what he does. No. You know? He's brilliant. He got poached. He used to work for Apple, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, so, but they wouldn't want him going off and starting his own thing. You know, it's like the whole point of school is to keep you in the system and to keep you working for other people and to keep you on the assembly line and working for the corporations. And um, you bust out of that and you do what I did and you start your own business and, you know, like, make your own way it's like i'm i'm not uh, benefiting that system i'm living outside of that I'm not benefiting that system and um, that's dangerous it's dangerous individuals are dangerous you know collective group think that's something that can be controlled and monitored and you know but having individuals with their own passionate paths and experiences and um uh, it's a, it's a totally different thing it's scary because it's it, it can't be controlled and it can't be known you know but it so. is a funny contrast as you pointed out that we kind of at the same time make movies about people who do style yeah. or art yeah, and then we glorify and you know or artists yeah. in some way and we glorify their passion yeah. and the drive to do what's right for them and so everyone i think and you know what that awesome. does though But what that does, though, and I actually think there might be some intention behind that. What that does, though, is it makes people feel really awful about themselves. Exactly. exactly. Don't have that. And and because everyone knows they lack this. Yeah. It's such a deep need to do what is right for you, but you were taught not to. Yeah. So it's like some sort of mm, candy coating to yeah. to watch a movie like that or read a novel like that or even read about it in some glittery ma- magazine yeah. Yeah. people like this kind of story because it's a huge lack in their life yeah it's so sad it's There's so sad so much beautiful well, life I mean, like i think what you know people actually think that learning can't happen without intentional instruction but it's it's been proven and i don't know if you're familiar with joseph chilton pierce but i love his some of the science and studies that he brings up. I was watching one of his talks not too long ago and he brought up this study. I can't remember, uh, I'm terrible with remembering like facts and figures, but um, he was talking about a doctor, I think it was a doctor who did a study about learning and it had to do with the percentage of learning that comes from in- intentional instruction. So when someone is intentionally instructing you, um, that only accounts for about 4% of our overall learning in our lifespan. <laughs> but you waste your whole childhood doing yeah. it or not doing it for 96% of your learning in your entire life is unconscious mm. it occurs in the unconscious it's mm. things that get picked up on almost on accident like not with the intention of like I'm going to learn that this is a cup today you don't do that that just happened when do you yeah. when did you learn this was a cup do you remember when did you learn you don't remember yeah we, we don't know how a youngest child learned to read. Yeah. Uh, we have, yeah. I have no I idea how we did it. I don't even teach him the alphabet. And I didn't see his siblings doing it either. No. But one day he could read in three languages. Yeah. There you go. It was just yeah. like that. And he yeah. was eight. It was fairly yeah. early, especially for the ana- amount of languages. I don't know how he learned. No. Hair either, by the way. <laughs> it was, it was, I, I mean, we're not afraid they start walking. We know they will start walking. Yeah. And for me, I learned uh, that yeah. reading is just the same. They will pick yeah. it up whenever they're well, ready. Because you realize, you realize that, um, like you said, like walking, talking, um, these all came from their own personal instinct and desire. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, why did the baby cross the room? I don't know, maybe there was something over there he wanted to get to. 
Like yeah. it was his own yeah. motivation. Mm. You know, why, why, why do you want to start feeding yourself? Why do you push your mom's hand away and grab the spoon yourself? Like that, that to me, that is human nature. Mm. It's evolution. It's independence. And, um, and that is inherent. You see it in babies. It's inherent. Mm. They roll onto their stomach. You did not teach them that. You did not tell them to do that. They get up on their knees. They walk across the room. They grab their own spoon. They push your hand away. They want to walk up those stairs by themselves. They want to go down that slide by themselves. What makes you think they're not going to want to read by themselves and they're not going to want to walk across the street by themselves because they do. They don't want to hold your hand forever. And they, they don't want to die them. either. You know, they, huh? they, not, they don't want to. Now you said the street. Yeah. So you don't have to. They don't want to die. Them. Yeah. They no. know the cars are dangerous. It's obvious it's dangerous. Yeah. 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 And I think yeah. that's, I think that's the, thing. I think that's the shift for parents is finding what you really believe about humanity and human nature. Do you actually think your children are suicidal? Do you actually think they're stupid? Do you think they're <laughs> and lazy. Yeah. And, and lazy. Do you think and that laziness, evil. suicidal tendencies, you know, lack of self-preservation, um, lethargy, stupidity. Do you think these are inherent human traits? And if you do, then your only choice is forced education. But if you actually can look at your child and you can notice because it's there, it is there in every child, you see that intense, unstoppable desire for independence. You know, they don't want you to wipe their butt forever. No. They don't, you know, and I remember being, um, I don't know, you know, like nine, 10, 11, like in those years and That was one of the things I think that motivated me to read was like, I didn't want a parent having to read me the menu in a restaurant anymore. Mm. I didn't want to be dependent. I didn't want to be like, what does that sign say? Every time I wanted to know what something said, I didn't mm. want to be dependent forever. I wanted to, I wanted to drive. I want to get my driver's license. I want to move out. I want to have my own life. Mm. And so it's like, I feel like as long as a child is, is supported in their mental and emotional you know, health and their natural state of well-being and balance, then all of that, that learning, as long as that natural independence isn't crushed, all of that learning is going to happen. And it's going to happen with very little effort on the parent's part, literally answer and the the child's part. Class, get them a book, you know, yeah. um, it's, it doesn't require that much. And I think that people don't realize when they, they think of unschooling and homeschooling, they think it's going to take all of this effort on the parents' part. And I see it all the time in the unschooling communities. Um, and it's coming from love and it's coming from fear and because they care about their kids. But this um, almost obsessive thing around providing resources and constantly making everything available to the point where we have something called strewing. Yeah. Putting things in your child's path. No, yeah. it's, it's like you you plan that uh, because you want your child to read, then you place certain books in place the books, you think oh, yeah, okay. into them. You strew you know, them around. Okay. You, yeah, I get it. You purposefully put items in your child's path that you want them to get interested in. So that they will learn something. But that's just basically being manipulative. Yeah, that's a form of manipulation for sure. And then what are you doing? You're teaching your children to be manipulative. So then um, they're strewing and there's also like to be stupid. Morning, morning baskets, you know, where people do like a basket and they put all the things in it for their kid every day and they make this thing. Okay, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be making fun of anyone. I'm not meaning to be insulting to anyone. Um, it's just that to me, these things seem like You're, you're freaking out, like you're freaking out. And it's like, wow, I, I want to give you a hug and tell you, take a deep breath and tell you that like, it's going to be okay. Like your kids are going to be okay. That you don't have to stress yours. I see parents stressing themselves out. And I just want to be like, it's really okay if you don't do anything today. Yeah. If you don't get them a new book and you don't put a game in their path and you don't, it's really okay. Like, honestly, I feel like less is more because when I was a kid, it was the silence and the space and the time. That's what I remember that was the most valuable in my childhood was the silence and the space and the time. It was the mom was there yeah. and she was available. But she was not doing this. 
And Mm. she was not worried about me. She was not worried about me. So I was not worried about myself. And if you are worried about your kids, they're going to worry about themselves and that's going to cause them self-consciousness and that's going to cause them fear. And that's going to get in the way of their learning. You have to have full confidence in your children's ability. And that's what I had. That's what I feel like made the biggest difference for me in my learning process is I knew my mom had full confidence in my capability, my intelligence. She never questioned. She never questioned if I was intelligent enough to learn something or if I was able to learn something. She always looked at me as if I was capable of anything. So I believed it. That's how I lived. Summer, um, when we decided to make our podcast, it was one of the reasons was we felt when we started our journey that there wasn't a lot of other people out there. When we started, there was not a lot of information. We are among the first couple of families in Denmark going down this road even. Um, and the more we go in depth with it, what I see is the biggest challenge uh, or the biggest development is needed for all us parents who ourselves have been through the system. It yeah. reminds me, de-schooling, the more I think about it, reminds me of a sentence, uh, a guy named Jack Canfield, who is in the transformational leadership uh, world. Uh, I've, I've worked with some people and he helped with well, marketing. He said this thing, and I, I keep remembering it. He said, personal development, the biggest part of it is removing the layers and part of yourself that isn't you. Um, and and for me, that is, I look at it with the same as de-schooling. What have I had installed in myself uh, of fears, other people's fears, that isn't me? And I actually believe a lot of us adults maybe don't know ourselves good enough uh, yet and and still have that. Um, yeah, to find what's original to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and then, bef- I mean, and then going down the road of uh, trusting your children if, if you don't trust yourself yet, that is a, a big step. Yeah. Well, but you know, and you can like, yeah, but you can... I feel like, yes, there's a whole process of like, uh, you know, a personal journey that parents have to go on and questioning a lot of things and um, self-inquiry, you know, why do I think this? Where did this thought come from? Why do I believe it? You know, because that's all they are. They're just thoughts and then you believe them. Um, but why did you believe them? And then investigating. And some of this, you know, can can actually be research. You can debunk a lot of these theories that you have about um schooling being necessary or forced education being necessary there's lots and lots of amazing reading material out there and there's studies and there's um it's really incredible so and that um if you need to go that way through the mind you know um, my mom didn't really do a lot of that she went through the through the gut the through heart. The heart. Yeah. She's a very deeply intuitive uh, person so um everyone kind of has their own their own approach, you know, and for some people, it might be a, more, a deeper, more personal, like spiritual evolution for themselves. And for some people, it might be more of a, a mental approach where they need to understand how learning happens and how a child's brain development works. And they actually want to study that um, for them to let go. So everybody kind of has their own, their own approach there. But I also feel like regardless of, of your own stage, like as long as you're aware that you are operating from fear in some areas, as long as you're aware and you're um, open to like learning these things about yourself and facing these things about yourself. I think if you, if you keep in mind just the idea, which to me is not an idea, it's a fact that you do not have the right to force another human being against their will to use their mind in ways in which they're unready for or uncomfortable with or unwilling to, regardless of their age or relation to you, that you do not have the right And if you just keep that in mind, you know, and every time you feel that urge to like make your kid do a learning activity, you have to like, be like, I don't have the right. You don't have the right because, Mm -hmm. you know, how would you feel if he did that to you? You know, absolutely. Um, And that, 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 that that to me, that's kind of just the basic is like, I don't, I don't have the right to force another human being against their Mm -hmm. will to use their mind in ways they're uncomfortable with or unready for. And that's where my mom came from. And, and, and then people want to be like, and that's why I say use their mind, because there are times when you do have to pick up your kid physically and put them in the car. We have to go to the hospital right now. You know, like there's times when things like that have to happen 
and they might not have full freedom or autonomy in some ways, but they're allowed to feel however they want about that or think whatever they want about that because their minds are free and you can't tell them how to think and how to use their mind. That's not your place or your position. Um, there are times when you will grab them from stepping out in front of a car because they do, you know, that's like a different kind of, does that make sense? I try to explain this sometimes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Do I know, like, well, we well, live it. Well, so. you have to just respect your freedom, so they're allowed to do whatever they want. And I go, no, that's no. not what I'm talking no, about. No. no, that's not what it is. It's not whatever. It's no. not a whatever life. Mm -mm. It's to us. We usually say safety and health. We get mm -hmm. to pull the parent card. Um, obviously, we we respect them and we talk to, and we respect yeah. their opinion and their point of view. Yeah. And sometimes, very often, actually, we're wrong and yeah. we stand corrected and we find a way together. But I do pull the yeah. card. I do say now yeah. is the time we have to do this or not do that or do yeah. more of this because we're yeah. becoming unhealthy or it's becoming dangerous and we have to yeah. do something about it. So that yeah. one, and I don't think for me, unschooling is about my kids being allowed to do whatever they want i think the whole yeah. idea of allowing which that would mean i had the option of not allowing exactly. and for me it's not for you to allow or disallow no. and also i think for me as a parent i want to live my life with my children mm -hmm. i don't want to be in this position of planning manipulation mm -hmm. control evaluation I want to go with my flow with the people I love and just live. And yeah. I couldn't do that if I had to make sure I had challenged their math skills and, yeah. and whatever every day and tick off all these little boxes and, and <laughs> it would yeah. it put so me in a professional yeah. relation with the people who are, I am so close to, and I don't want that. I, it would be very unauthentic. It would be, yeah, it would be inauthentic. Would be, well, and it would also be because I, as the child, I will say that um, you'd be robbing your children of the most beautiful gift you can possibly give them, which is you. Mm, yeah, exactly. Which we have you. to. I have to be there as a real human yeah, being the with authenticity, emotions and more, passion, self, and um, and the the connection and the friendship because that's the whole point to me is like what I have with my mom there is no academic learning that could possibly be worth damaging that connection in any way shape or form I don't care I don't care what anybody says there's nothing worth damaging that because that that what I had with my mom what we all had with my mom um the connection and the relationship that we had with her is it's it's everything it is everything and I I genuinely believe like especially from um Joseph Chilton Pierce and his studies on child brain development and even like how even from the womb and the, I mean it's incredible um and then reading books like the continuum concept and like that that connection that parent child connection is literally everything and if you sacrifice one piece of that you know the whole thing can crumble like that is the the basis of your child's mental and emotional well-being throughout their entire life happens from conception um, and how their brain develops. And the moment that you sacrifice that relationship and that connection for some, like for fear, you're choosing fear. You're afraid that your child, you, you're going to choose fear that your child is going to be stupid over the relationship and the connection that you have with them. I mean, what is that teaching your child about what's important in life? Mm. You know? You leave them every time you do that. You leave your child. You abandon them every time you do that. Every time you 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 have to disconnect to force someone to do something. Yeah, you cannot yeah. be connected and force. They don't coexist. Force and connection do not coexist. It's impossible. And, and if you're connected with someone, force is not required because you should be able to flow together and you know in a give and take. And there should be able to like, um, but. It is always really interesting to me that people, we, that we all kind of fell for this idea that learning stops at five years old and that suddenly it has to be forced and that academic learning is different than other kinds of learning and that we've separated, that we've separated some types of learning, very specific subjects, and we've distilled them, we've extracted them from life 
And, and so they're not no longer in their whole form. It's like eating processed food. You know, it's a processed food now to sit down and just do a math worksheet. That is, um, it's not- There's nothing to do with math, it actually. It has nothing to know. do with math. No, There's nothing so real about it now. Separating, and that's why it's kind of going back to what you said earlier, something about like, uh, not even, what did you say? I don't remember, but not knowing how you learned something. I don't know how I learned most of the math. Most of the math that I know, I don't really know. And then I've, I've, because I've been asked this question so many times, you know, people want to know, I've had to like really look and remember and ask my mom and we've had these conversations and she's like, I don't, you know, <laughs> um, and, and then I do, I have some memories of things that happened um, yeah. where I learned certain aspects of math and stuff, but it all came from a very personal desire, personal reasons, you know, and it, it wasn't, and it one math I just learned the thing on purpose. Like people want to know how learning happens. And I'm like, well, you know, it's kind of like if you if you want to. Yeah, it's like if you want to get to the other side of the room, you better learn how to walk. And it's basically yeah. like that. It's like you yeah. don't learn to walk for the sake of walking. You learn how to walk to get somewhere. And that's how I learned how to do everything was mostly to get somewhere, to get something yeah. that I wanted. Because you, know? you were doing something else, basically. Yeah, was the I wanted to know yeah. what happened next in Harry Potter for myself because mm -hmm. I wanted to know. I had a personal desire to find out what happened next and I got tired of waiting. So I did it for myself. And that's kind of how everything happened. You know, I wanted to sell my jewelry at the farmer's market. So I had to, you know, I had to learn figure how to use my credit cards and how to, to figure that out. And then I had to learn, I wanted to sell my work. So then I had to budget and I had to save some of that money to buy new materials. And I had to, and I didn't do that on purpose. I didn't want to learn how to budget. No. <laughs> No, so we have to somehow. We I would love to keep talking, but but we try to keep our podcast around an hour so we people have time. time. Yeah. Um, summer. We can I, talk forever. Yeah, and I love what you say about uh, as a parent to be in the connectedness and how you cannot when you force your when you try to force someone you're no longer in the connectedness it makes me want to be uh, a bit of that uh, and yeah. i'll take that with me you can run over and hug the kids before the next <laughs> yeah, podcast yeah, yeah. <laughs> anytime yeah so yeah. some it was a real big pleasure if people want to uh, get to know more about you uh, where should they find you um well i have a page on facebook called This Beautiful Living Freedom. And I have a Patreon where everything's free. It's not like for money. It's just to have everything in one place because I didn't feel like building a website at the time. Yeah. But I might build a website because I do, I enjoy writing and I've done a few of these interviews. So I've got links to some video interviews, podcast interviews. Um, and then I have some some pieces that I've written on, on different topics and they're posted on my Patreon and on my Facebook page. This Perfect. beautiful freedom but you can also just find me at summer jean yeah uh, we will we will post a link and uh, thank you for your time and it has been beautiful talking with you thank you for listening we hope you enjoyed today's episode and if you like them then please share it with all your friends and family we would also love it if you gave our podcast a review thanks and if you want to support our podcast and work then you can find us on patreon.com slash the conrad family we will continue to travel full time. And if you want to tag along, then please follow us on Facebook and Instagram at The Conrad Family. And you can also read more than 100 blog posts on our website, theconrad.family. Until next time, make a wonderful day. Thank you.